Doing walking meditation, sometimes people think that is a second class meditation or just a filler between sitting meditations when it's too sore in your backside or back. So you start doing walking meditation, but it's a beautiful meditation in and of itself. And I say that because uh, when I first became a monk over in Thailand, I used to do an hour's walking meditation every morning in the main hall. And when I did that walking meditation in the main hall in Thailand, that's Wat Saket, middle of Bangkok, they had a grandfather clock which would ch chime every quarter hour. And uh, at least I could know just you know, how fast I was going. And it took me half an hour to maybe walk the length of the maybe 20 meter hall, turn around and walk back again. And that's how long it took every time. And I was not forcing it because how I would do walking meditation, when I begin and make myself nice, nice and easy, just make sure there's no tight pieces of clothing. I put my hands in front of me and then I would uh, just uh, look down at the floor. It was a carpeted floor inside this uh, important ordination hall in the middle of Bangkok. It was really comfortable. And so I would feel what it's like to move and to lift one foot up and just all of the muscles and other sensations you would feel in your mostly lower legs and the soles of your feet. I would always do it barefoot. Uh, of course, it was a warm country, so you didn't need uh, to worry about socks, if at all possible. If you've got a warm place, so you don't need socks, you get much more sensitive to the contact between your own feet and just the uh, whatever you were walk uh, standing on or sitting on or, or walking on. I even mentioned that this morning, just sitting at my desk here in front of the computer. I have my feet just on a, a little piece of carpet. It's only a tiny piece, but the heels are on the uh, plastic uh, linoleum floor. And you can feel it. And it's that contrast there was really important for me to be able to really get into the feelings of the feet when I was sitting here meditating, beginning with the meditation. And I do that when I do walking meditation. You can feel like, in this case, like carpet, what it feels like on the soles of my feet. And then to, to move one uh, foot upwards. For me, like the, the heels move up first of all. And I say, what's the next thing which moves away from the floor? And it is you know, the balls of my feet. And then you know, the placing your feet just behind your toes. And then that moves up. I can feel the tightness in the muscles of my lower legs as they raise the foot upwards. And as it moves upwards, you can feel all the different sensations which are necessary uh, just to walk. And so as it moves up, then the heels move a tiny bit backwards. And then the soles, they don't go straight, they go in a curve. And as they go in a curve, I'm uh, exaggerating there, uh, then you go forward and then your foot goes down. It doesn't go straight down. It goes a tiny bit forward. And then the first part which touches the floor is usually the balls of my foot, the outside part of those balls of the foot, then the toes, and then often those uh, balls of the feet, they move backwards and forwards to make sure you're secure. And then the heel comes down and the weight of your body gets transferred onto that. And then you decide to do the second foot. You started with the right foot, then the left foot. And just one step was so much going on in my legs. It wasn't just like being like a military exercise. It was more like learning how to be a dancer and how to just see what is necessary just for one movement of one leg. And then just how the weight would transform from one leg to the other. And then you start the, the next step. And so there was too much going on to go fast. And that's what I was focused on. The eyes were open and they were looking at a space of body's length in front of me. 
because there's a body to link in front of you, it gave me a sense of safety. Now, there were snakes in Thailand, even in the city, and if a snake came in, at least I could see it. Of course, I would not need to be worried, because if you're going so slowly, so peaceful, snakes can never harm you. And they just kind of wonder, what the heck is this guy doing? Never seen this before. But it certainly gives a sense of safety for any snakes who happen to be there. And so you do your walking that way. And it takes half an hour for me to walk, I'm not forcing it, not trying to go slow, not trying to beat my personal best, but just going slowly. And as you got to the other end, you turn around slowly and walk back. And the reason why I found out how powerful the walking meditation is, was when I heard the sound and it was amazing. It was like 100 meters away, 200 meters away. Something was calling me. Rama Wang So. Rama Wang So. And I just couldn't understand, you know, what this sound was. I could recognize it was my name being called. But it sounded such a long distance away. But I realized that, you know, I should pay attention to it. I was a very, very junior monk at the time. So I really had to pay attention to it. And as soon as I stopped focusing on the muscles in my lower legs and the feeling sensation in my feet, then I realized it was another monk shouting in my ear hole. His lips were just about, you know, one centimeter away from my ear. He'd been sent there to come and get me, I realized, because I should have been at an, this invitation to a house blessing, and I'd forgotten. And he came to get me, and he realized what he needed to do to get my attention. He was another monk. He knew what meditation was. And the best way to actually to get in to that meditation cocoon, which I was in, was using sound. And when he was uh, using that sound, you know, he had to actually shout into my ear so I could actually pay attention. I could hear him. At first it was like a long distance away. And so once I could hear him, then I realized I had to turn my head around. And it took about two or three minutes, no exaggeration, to turn my head around to actually see him and he realized it was a monk. I recognized who he was and he was just right next to me. And then I said it took a lot and just turning your neck, so many sensations you can watch. And it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, seeing all the things which a lot of us take for granted of how to move your neck. And when I got eye contact with him, that's when I said, what? Unfortunately, it was another monk who came to get me. If it was a lay person, they'd have probably thought I was on some some hallucinogenic drugs or something, because it wasn't a weird. It was a weird, not usual response. But it just showed me just how you can get into even walking meditation. Very peaceful, very beautiful. So that's how to do it. Attention about body length in front of you, eyes open or half open, if you wish. Uh, hands in front of you. If you want to put them around your back, fine. Walk naturally. And if you really have attention on the what it needs just to move one leg in one step, then you have so many things to watch and it becomes fascinating. So that's how I recommend walking meditation to be done. Hopefully that makes sense to you. If you want to ask any questions afterwards, please do so. Is that okay? Hi, Chanda. Yes, wonderful. So, um, yeah, now we're going to do some meditation. Uh, for okay. About minutes, Ajahn, and then at five minutes. How long? About 40 minutes, and then we can have a five minute break and some question and answers. So okay, yeah. I think we need at least probably four to five minutes for the questions. And just to what remind I... to everybody again to please only send your questions after the meditation. That would be very okay. helpful. And uh, the co-host will send them to me also after the meditation okay. in the little break. Okay. So, so okay. 40 minutes. 
That will be to quarter past. Yeah, or maybe ten past. Yeah. Let's say ten past. Sorry? Let's say ten past. Oh, to ten past, okay. So we can have a five minute break and then. Uh, okay, okay. The ten past. Something like that. Super. Okay. And again, I will lead at the very beginning. I don't know how far I can go. If my meditation really cuts to take off, I become silent. So sitting down in your meditation position, remember the point of your posture is so you can be so content that your body can vanish. Sum it up directly. So I start with closing my eyes and doing a general feeling of the body. Now, how are you, body? I've just been down in our hall, just checking in with some of the monks who've been working hard. And novices and lay people. And then I make sure my body feels okay. And when it does, I look again. This time with the eyes closed and part by part. I said to feet first of all. I know I just went too slowly at uh, the previous meditation. So I'm just going to notice the feet. It's only 40, 35 minutes. And explore how they feel. I don't pass over them too quickly. And I just notice that in my the ankle of my left foot is a bit itchy. I haven't got a clue why, but I don't need to scratch. I just look at it with my mind, relax it. I don't resist it, but allow it to be. Because I always know that caring is more effective than curing. <laughs> My goodness, it almost went away there. Now it has gone away. Sometimes I feel it's just my body wants some attention. So I happily give it the attention. So go up to the, the ankles proper. I relax them. My eyes are closed and if I do need to move my body, I always will do. I will never say, no, I'm started now. You can't be moved. If that movement is going to create more comfort, I will do that. It is true you disturb your meditation slightly, but you soon make up that lost ground and go far deeper into your meditation. And go up the calves of my legs. After the, the previous guided meditation, my legs feel so much more at ease. But I allow them to relax even more. Even suggesting to your lower legs, relax relax and encouraging them, they've learned to follow those suggestions because they know the benefits. It's called kindfulness and those legs really do get to a nice state of ease. Then I go up to my knees. Sitting down, my knees feel so much at ease. I am old, so I keep on telling you. And sometimes, you know, the knees get a bit stiff when you sit down for too long. They sit down talking to people. But when I'm meditating, the knees relax so much, there's no aches or pains there at all. What I do is, I'm aware of the feelings in both knees. And I learn how to 
even sometimes imagine them just loosening up, being at ease, expanding, opening up blocked channels to stop energy flowing into and around those knees. I know that imagination does work when you're meditating. Now when these feel really nice, nicely at ease. So I go now from the knees to the thighs. Even the thighs feel comfortable. But I always check them first of all. I don't want to ignore anything. I go to my butt muscles. I was a bit concerned when I first looked at them. Didn't think my robe underneath my butt was, was properly spread out. If you're wearing a robe, or you know, wearing a skirt, or even trousers are quite tight. But the robe sometimes can have loose pieces of cloth, bunch up, and they can stick into your flesh and cause you soreness after a while. So I make sure the robe covering my bottom is spread evenly, which it now is. And I know the feeling of pressure on my bottom muscles will disappear. So go up to my waist. And today I'm going to do what I usually do when I'm sitting on the floor. I just push up my back. Make it more firm. That takes an effort to put it up there. But once it's up there, it feels great. It's the way I usually meditate, if I possibly can. Go up my muscles of the back. Relaxing. If I see anything which is imbalanced, of course I will move. And then I go back down to the bottom of the torso and go up that part of my body slowly in the inside. I can feel my colon is pretty much at ease. But I did you now have a good cup of tea. And I can kind of feel that inside my intestines and colon. I relax it. I let it be. Go up to my stomach. My stomach's really at ease now. So I'll go up further above my stomach and my lungs. And again, uh, I do suffer from, actually I wouldn't call it suffering. I do have a remnant of my father's asthma, which is just allergies and hay fever sometimes. Today, my lungs feel free. When I'm meditating, I'm hardly using much oxygen. So my metabolism decreases and my breath gets softer. I'm just doing this to relax the muscles of the lungs, not to get into the breath meditation yet. And I go up to my heart region. Very rarely can I feel the sensations in the heart. The heart beats quite slowly and, and peacefully. But just checking. Making sure everything feels free and at ease. There's no tightness or tension there. And I go up to my shoulders. 
uh, I can experience some tightness there, tension. So I'm focusing exclusively on my shoulders. I move my body a little bit just to a little bit of stretching on those shoulders. Now I let them be. I do imagine that they are loosening. Any tightness there was, I don't know for what reason. I loosen it up. Just like a guitar string, when you loosen one of the little knobs which tightens it, makes it really loose, so there's no tension on it at all. And if anything plucks that guitar string, it makes no noise, it's too loose. That's my explanation to resilience. All of those muscles or tendons or anything else in, that make up my shoulders, I take off the tension. I'm not trying to hold my muscles in some particular way. I loosen them. I let them be. I don't hold them, don't stretch them. And I allow those shoulder muscles to relax so much that the tightness which was there at the beginning is now gone. So I go down my arms to my elbows. Those elbows very rarely do I feel any aches or pains in there. But I check anyway. Go past the elbows to the, the wrists. So the forearms first and then the wrists. My body surprises me. Well, I was just missing out the forearms, but then I went back to them. It's as if they said, thank you. I feel such a pleasant feeling in the, in the forearms. They are relaxed, but they need to be paid attention from time to time. Just like people you know and care for, animals, pets you care for. They do need your attention just to know that you're there. I go to my hands and my fingers. It's amazing when I'm not really paying attention to a meditation postures, my fingers, they assume all sorts of positions. How are your fingers located now? I'm in a position, it's not that too uncomfortable, but I'm going to change them, move them to the right hand over the left hand. With the thumb slightly touching. That's, I got used to that as being where I get some of the best meditations. So I put my fingers in that position. And it does feel good. And I go back up to my shoulders. They turned a little bit, but now I'm loosening them again. To my neck. The neck can become painful if you've got your head too far forward or too far back or too far to the left or the right. So at this point, I don't mind just moving my head around to find the most comfortable position, the best balance point in my head upon my neck. Once I get that point, I leave my head in that position. And then I go to the muscles in the front of the face. I go there because those muscles, when they're tight, they indicate there's some emotional difficulties there expressed in my face. That's why you can tell if a person's angry or they're depressed. You see it written on their face, as they say, when it's all relaxed. The face feels so at ease. And the, and the emotions are softened. I don't leave my body yet. I check it up as a whole, like everything together. 
one unit. Did I miss anything out? And I do this and I want to share it with you because when I see the hold of my body so relaxed, it's not even just for health, it feels delightful. There's a certain flavour of pleasure comes up for me at this point. I recognise it because I've been doing this for so long. The pleasure of a relaxed body. When I am aware of that, focus on that, the pleasure of a relaxed body, my body gets more relaxed. I notice that and I feel, well, this is what I need to do to relax my body to the max. This is physical. There's a bit of mind involved here. That's why it relaxes even deep and feels more pleasurable. So I pause there. I give myself rewards. I also know its benefits too. The body will remain much healthier when you can relax it so much and experience the delight of relaxation. And I go further into the sixth sense world, the mind. And the usual way I find the most um, easy and compelling is to ask myself, how peaceful am I? Uh, I suggest to you, how peaceful are you right now? What does that peace feel like? To get to know it. And it's delight. What makes that peace stable and very strong? Will always be this present moment. I let go of the past. I let go of all those reasons to be tired. I let go of all that stuff which has happened. Stay in this moment and be kind to this moment. This moment is my friend. I want to invite you, friend, present moment, to hang out with me. You can only hang out with friends you feel safe with. And that allows me to be here. And as for the future, I know that now, the quality of this moment now, is what makes the future pleasant and easy and healthy and wise. I'm creating my future right now. I'm just noticing this present moment. What I'm doing is not focusing on anything except the present moment. What's happening now? I'm being kind to this moment. That helps me stay here. It gets to the point I don't want to speak anymore. I don't want to give things names. You go into silence. Beautiful, gorgeous silence. Other things, other focuses of meditation, such as breath or these beautiful lights and images or whatever, these will just develop. 
you go deeper inside the silence, deeper inside the present moment. You don't go on to anything. You always go in, inside, whatever you experience now, to experience the next stage. So well, please excuse me. It's my mind won't let me speak.
it's becoming close to the end of the meditation. Don't open your eyes yet. And you know how peaceful you are. And notice how joyful that peace is. Perception of this inner pleasure is really important for the progress of meditation. Feels nice. It's good. Then you can feel how your body is. The body is so relaxed. I can't feel my legs, my hands. Feel the back and the head. This is what happens. Through stillness, things disappear. Through stillness, things get energized and healed. So when you are ready, come out of the meditation and open your eyes when you are ready. Again, thank you. Now, apparently, there's time for a toilet break if you need one. Every evening, you can continue meditating with your eyes closed. And you can actually get up to go to the toilet at any time. In five minutes, we will begin the Q&A. So, are you ready for the first question, Ajahn? I'll read them out to you. Oh, yes, your person, certainly. All righty. Thank you so much for the opportunity to learn and meditate together despite the distance. I have a chronic illness and a lot of pain, no life risk. I'm still with some very basic questions. When I start meditation, the body starts moving and twitching and hurting in different places. It takes me a long time to relax the body. I rarely ever get to relax the mind. Breath goes down. I get very peaceful and happy. 90% of the pain goes away, but immediately after opening my eyes, being relaxed, I get very sleepy, never energized after the meditation. Okay, so then there's a few different questions. Is it time for watering the seed and keep giving love to the body or is there any suggestion to do something different? And some advice on how to get to know the pain would be great. I usually give the body love and warmth. Should it be the object of my meditation to give pain love, to open the door of my heart to the situation, to pain? Thanks so much. Basically, the answer is... Yes, to give that loving kindness to the pain. But if it's really loving kindness, it is opening the door of your heart to that pain. But also, that it, don't try and get rid of it. You're caring. Don't try and cure that chronic condition. Trying to cure it means you think you're loving it, but you're loving it, expecting it to go away. So if you can take that next step of pain, you can stay with me. I'll be your friend. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. That that sounds very simple, but it's profound, isn't it? This idea Absolutely. of unconditional mindfulness, not being Indeed. mindful so that something changes or loving it so that it... Indeed, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then I must say that when you do that, then it goes. <laughs> when you're trying to get rid of it, it stays. It gets worse. <laughs> okay. Next question. Is it good all the time to be aware of whatever arises and passing away, seeing this also with kindness, or simply practice being in the present moment continuously? 
uh, no, that's putting too much pressure on you. When you say this is what you should be doing. And then it's not actually feeling this moment, what's appropriate. There are times when you don't, I'm not mindful at all. When you're asleep, in those times, just let go. Don't think I should practice like this or practice like that. Just the kindness and the care. And you find, if I'm watching this present moment all the time, I can't speak with you. I already mentioned that sometimes the mind just refuses. It's nice and peaceful, it's turning off. It doesn't want to talk. But then I sense of I agreed that it's my obligation. And I do this happily, actually, to teach this retreat. So I teach it. Okay. Dear Ajahn, could you give any advice for working with anxiety during meditation? When I experience deeper meditations, I often get strange and new sensations and it can make me anxious. For now, I've been focusing on metta and allowing the experience to be. That's excellent, allowing the experience to be. That softens this moment and when it softens this moment, just hang out in this moment. And anxiety is always having an idea of some future somewhere where it might all go wrong or you might lose things. And always remember, don't be a winner, be a loser. That's how Ajahn Chah would always teach me. You don't meditate to attain things, you meditate to let go of things. Not to be a winner, to be, be a loser. And so my anxiety would be if I'm not losing enough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question. The more that I appreciate silence, the less I feel able to tolerate noise and pop music. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame you. <laughs> Sometimes I take a walk and a car with a loud music passes by. Although I don't like the music, I pick up some of that and it becomes an earworm that pops up again annoyingly. Any advice on how to tolerate noise when silence becomes more attractive? Uh, I just, the last couple of days, I was uh, in Suwanabumi Airport in Bangkok, and sometimes you have to wait for somebody, and it's such a noisy place to sit. So years ago, I developed this kind of imagination of imagining a bubble around me, and in that bubble I could sit and meditate so peacefully, even though there was so much noise around me. And I do remember just coming out of that meditation, this is a few years ago, in Sawanabumi Airport, and I had a few people that were just bowing to me, doing like the veneration to me, and not because I said anything or taught anything, just to see. And then there's a monk there who could sit quietly amidst all the noise. It's not that hard to do. After a while, when you're kind to the silence inside the noise, then that becomes so gorgeous. You don't want to look at the outermost petals of the, of the lotus flower. You just gaze at the innermost petals. They're far more beautiful. And once you notice that, the mind doesn't just wander out to the, the second class you know, outermost petals. The noise, you never sort of get upset and angry people making noise. You know, if if that was me and I got disturbed by noise, I'd always remember that I went to so many rock concerts when I was young, uh, even to the Ida White Festival and goodness knows how many other festivals I went to. And, you know, as a, a young man in the 60s and 70s, and it's my karma. I had to enjoy some noise. <laughs> But I don't get upset. I just build this little bubble around me. And I'm just listening inside. Or what's outside. As I mentioned in the walking meditation simile, you can still hear the noise on the outside. It's like a long, long, long distance away. Cool. Okay, there was one time I happened to come out of a meditation abruptly and I was feeling groggy afterwards. Is this normal or did I do anything wrong? Thank you, Edgar. 
Yeah, it is normal because you came out way too quickly. And it's a simple simile, which Ajahn Chah, I remember hearing from him, is like pouring hot water into a cold glass. You know, your mind becomes so cool, so peaceful. But if you try and do something really fast, it just, the mind just rebels, the, little, the glass cracks. And so it is important to come out of meditation gently. I never like ringing a gong at the end of meditation. If I do have a little bell to ring, it's like a Tibetan, what's what they call it, which chimes, singing bowl rather than a real bang gong. Because your mind is just so cool. And that sort of heavy, heavy noise just really jars the senses. So please come out of meditation softly, gently. And one nice way of doing that is just to say, I will come out after the count of 10, say 10, 9, 8, 7. It's preparing the brain. So the brain can actually start to turn on the correct circuits so it can come back to sensory consciousness again. Five, four, three, two, one, and then open your eyes. Uh, next question, which I'm sure relates to most people. What is your best advice to avoid getting sleepy during meditation? Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, sleepiness is not the problem. Uh, there's a cause for the sleepiness. And uh, you may have heard me tell this story because it's a common question. And this is a common answer. Is in those days in Northeast Thailand, it's extremely hot and very muggy. And so even the climate was not what I was used to. I was born in London. And also we didn't have much food. I was, I was malnourished. And even I remember just on my sixth range, my fifth range retreat, I just went to visit one of the toughest monks in Thailand, I was Ajahn Mahabua. And he had a rule that no one could start eating before he started eating. And when he finished, everybody had to finish. I was only visiting, I was told that beforehand, he said, when you start eating, eat fast, otherwise you won't get enough to eat. Well, when I was uh, eating, Ajahn Mahabur finished, and everyone else finished, and then Ajahn Mahabur looked at me and told me, he ordered me, eat more. I was really thin and scrawny then, very thin, and he took pity on me and ordered me to eat more. And of course, you don't you have to follow those kind of orders. It was from compassion and kindness. So I was malnourished, honestly. And it was very hot. And also, I never had enough sleep. We had a silly idea that the less you sleep, the better. And I was only doing four and a half hours a day of sleep, which wasn't enough. So what happened was I got sleepy during the meditation. I didn't have the energy. I fought with willpower. Sometimes you would break through. When you break through, then you were restless, thinking too much. You generated too much willpower and you couldn't turn it down. And it was only after having to go to Bangkok to renew visa that we were staying, we were allowed to stay in one of these Bangkok monks' quarters which had an air, well, it didn't have an aircon, but we were well fed. We could sleep a little bit longer. And the, uh, we found this room which had an aircon in it. We managed to get the keys and we could meditate there in the morning. And all my sleepiness disappeared. Every morning we get up at 3 a.m., 4 o'clock we're in that room and meditating, turned on the aircon. Comfortable, there was hardly any mosquitoes in there. You had a nice sleep, you had nice food. And as a result of that, all my sleepiness 
vanished. It disappeared for days. And I kind of realized that it was not that I wasn't doing the right techniques. It was just the general causes. And that's one of the reasons why after the Buddha's enlightenment, the first teaching he gave was not Four Noble Truths. The first teaching he gave was the middle way. Please avoid the extremes of sensory indulgence, but also avoid the extremes of those too much renunciation. Uh oh, I just started a disappearing act. She vanished. Too much renunciation. Well, there you are. You're muted, Aja. I'm unmuted now. Yeah, I thought you'd been. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. But if you go too ascetic, the words Atta Kinamata New Yoga. It means practices which tire you, which take away your energy, which cause that sleepiness. And so please keep yourself in as best physical condition you can, so you don't get tired as best you possibly can. Yeah. So that's what I would say to people. If you do feel sleepy, just take a rest. Excellent. Okay. Lovely to see you. Ajahn Ven Chanda Ven Upeka and all again. Sadhu times three. Question. In the Anapana 16 steps, each step starts with breath, breathe in and breathe out, starting with long breath and out long, then breath, breathe in, rapture, breathing out, rapture, etc. It doesn't mention leaving the breath at any stage. So is the awareness of the breath there at each step in the background at each stage? Thank you. And that's uh, an easy question, easy answer. Of course, it's not there at every stage. It's first times you, if you look at the first, I think, four stages of Anapana Sati, you are aware of the breath. You are aware of the breath if it is long or if it is short. What happens if it's in the middle somewhere? That was a question which bugged me when I started meditating on the breath. Sometimes my breath was not long, it was not short, it was kind of in the middle somewhere. And so was I doing the breath meditation right? So knowing whether the breath is long or short is just an alternative. You don't have to do one then the other. It gives you something else to notice when you're watching the breathing. But then when you actually get to the next four stages, next four stages of the breath meditation you'll find that um okay i've got my network bandwidth is low and i think that is probably why uh you know i dropped out last time yeah. and yeah. i think it is because i think it's our fault over here on a tuesday evening they usually do another zoom talk and from another location in our monastery, but the same bandwidth uh, for our so-called Armadale group. We should finish in another 30 minutes, actually when I finish, so sorry about that. I'll try my best here. That when you are um, the, the fifth, sixth and seventh stages, an eighth stage of breath meditation, it doesn't say that you watch the breath it says, as you are breathing in, as you are breathing out, your mindfulness in the second and the, uh, was it fifth, sixth and seventh and eighth part, uh, fifth, sixth and seventh part of, uh, and eighth part of the Anapanasati, that is where you are aware of the pity and the sukha, which is with the breath. You may say that this is watching the breath, when you actually examine those words, those piti sukha, it now becomes a chitta sankara. It's actually how the mind experiences, sorry, how the mind experiences the breath, not how you feel the breath. It's knowing the breath, not through the sense of physical touch, but through the mind. It's where the, the physical feeling of the breath is turning off. And especially 
in the, the next quadrant, the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. What are you doing in the ninth? You're being aware of the jitter. The breath is actually vanishing totally now. This becomes what we call the nimitta. That's the beautiful light in the mind. And then just you learn how to boost up the energy of that nimitta. You know, it's, you, know, you get some joy and confidence in it and it builds up and becomes incredibly beautiful. And then you still that nimitta, samadha hanjitang. That's where instead of moving around upwards and around and twirling around, it stays perfectly still. And the usual simile they give is like the full moon. And you know, the full moon doesn't move fast. It just is very slow and stable. And the last part of that is you enter the jhana, where mochi yang chitang. And that you know, is not aware of the breath at all at that time. You've transcended the breath. And to make it quite clear, this is like the simile of how so King Ajata Satu uh, met the Buddha just before uh, the Buddha passed away in his last year. The Buddha was staying in the hall in the bamboo grove outside of Rajagaha. And Ajata Satu was taken by his doctor, Jiwaka, to see the Buddha for the first time. And so they arranged the carriages. Ajata Satu was a king. So they arranged this beautiful carriage and it took him as far as the carriage could go to the boundary of the bamboo grove, the Welawana. And as uh, the king uh, got to as far as the carriage could go, he had to get out of the carriage and start walking in his shoes. And that's where he started to get a bit scared. You know, they had some kind of safety inside of a carriage and a vehicle. Now he had to start walking. But Jivaka, uh, his doctor, just uh, assured him there would be no problem at all, no danger. And Ajata Satu got up to the main hall in the Bamboo Grove Monastery. And there he had to take off his shoes. The vehicle of shoes had to be discarded. And then he could go inside the hall. And there it was uh, the Ajata Satu asked, which one of those many monks is the Buddha? And Jivaka, who knew him very well, sort of said, he's that one sitting on one of the big pillars in the hall facing east. And that's where Jivaka could actually see it and meet the Buddha. But he couldn't drive the chariot inside the hall. He couldn't wear his shoes inside the hall. These are different vehicles we use in order to get, you know, to uh, the deep meditations. And that's what we have to do. We don't start by using the breath. If you read that uh, breath meditation carefully, you find the first thing you do is actually find a quiet place, a, a comfortable place to sit comfortably. You don't have to sit cross-legged in the full lotus. Many people are old, oh, they need chairs. If they sit five or 10 minutes on the ground, they will get very sore and not be able to meditate at all. It's why we have chairs, while we have comfortable meditation cushions or stools. And so we can be comfortable. And then we start by arousing that mindfulness and making it strong. It's not putting mindfulness in front of you. There is no you, so where are you supposed to put the blooming thing? Instead, you just make awareness, mindfulness a priority. And I usually try and do that by watching my body and relaxing and it feels good. This is what mindfulness is supposed to give you, this wonderful feeling of joy and balance in this present moment. And then you allow the breath to come. When the breath does come, you can just notice it. What's it like? Long, short, medium, doesn't really matter. You can count on the breath. You can do these mantras with the breath. If you're sick, breathing in health, breathing out all these tumor particles or whatever. And that really makes it interesting, but it actually works too. It has the benefits, you do get good health. And then you use you know, the, that breath to calm the body down. When you are breathing and just noticing the breath, you're not thinking too much. You're not moving the body. 
the body rests and relaxes, it disappears even more. And when you get to these stages of meditation, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth of experience, pity and sukha, don't go analyzing which one is pity, which one is sukha. Just enjoy the bliss, and then later on you'll be able to make that distinction, usually when you have jhanas. But then later on you find that answer, but at the moment just enjoy. And then again the body kind of vanishes. You see these beautiful lights in the mind. All that uh, work has got you to that point using different vehicles. But you don't take the old vehicle onto the new path. Just in similar simile which the Buddha used, like crossing the river, you use a, a boat and it takes you so far to cross the river. And once you've crossed the river, you don't carry that boat on your back. You leave it alone. And then you can use another vehicle, just your shoes, to walk on the dry land. You don't carry a boat on the dry land. So I extended that answer, and that's usually my way. But I usually, you ask a question and I give you a sermon, or a long talk, but I thought that was really important to know. Hope you enjoyed that answer. Okay, just two or three more questions. Um... Dear Ajahn, I've meditated for many years, but it doesn't seem to make any progress. I still do not experience anything except thoughts coming up. I wonder what is called progress in meditation. Progress doesn't exist in meditation, it's ingress. Mm -hmm. Don't try and go on to the next thing. And so you go into that thinking process, you go right inside of it. Why are you thinking? A lot of times, it's not in order to get insight. That's not what our thinking does. These days, you know, when people ask me, well, how does insight happen? And I say, exploring. You'll find that thinking is uh, so conditioned by other people's ideas. And some of those ideas are not really valid. You think about them, and you think in language, which is limited. And so you don't have the means to see clearly. This was a simile which I gave when, for one weird reason, I was giving a talk, a keynote address at the World Computer Conference in 2019. This was not just a few people. This was, I remember, just chatting afterwards to the head of cybersecurity for the European Union. He was saying, he was really interested in what I was saying. And I was saying about innovation, even in the computer industry. Well, what was a Buddhist monk doing in that in industry? Or just giving a keynote address there. And I just said, look, this is how we, we innovate or find insights in Buddhism, not, not by just thinking about old ideas. And I said, just, I held up something, my old cup again. So what is this I'm holding up? And of course, people said, cup. Yeah, what else is it? What else is it? What else is it? And you get past all your old ideas which have been taught. There's not a right answer. If you say cup, you think you've done it, finished with it, you don't have to look anymore. The way of insight is keeping on looking. There's no right answer or wrong answer. You use this to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's actually what we do with our meditation. We go deeper, 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 deeper. And that thought is just this inner commentary, which isn't valid. And a good example of that is the example I often give of Lao Tzu. Where he would walk with one of his disciples every evening, as long as they would keep quiet. They weren't allowed to speak. And they came to a ridge, in the mountains at the time of this a beautiful sunset. And the students, first time walking with the master, couldn't help but just blurt out, wow, what a beautiful sunset. And the master turned around, went back to his monastery, and he banned that young student from going on a walk with him ever again. When they asked why, that's a bit tough. Then he said, when my student said, what a beautiful sunset, 
he was not watching the sunset anymore. He was watching the words. And that, when I first heard that, I thought, wow, I get that. What a beautiful answer that was. That's why when you're thinking, you're not watching the thing itself anymore. You're watching the, exp the explanation, the words. It's a different thing you're watching. Okay. When you're silent, you actually see things and you appreciate them so much more. Thank you. Right, uh, a long and slightly more involved question. So, uh, dear Ajahn, this sense of self disappeared. I mean, the only knowing consciousness was left in March 2019. <laughs> uh, it happened as an accident unexpectedly. It never happened again, but I had a glimpse of non-self. I feel that what prevents the experience from happening again is the enormous attachment experienced by this mind from mind activity itself. When activity, and I think mind activity fades, it's perceived to be unnatural, weird, and scary. Some sort of safety mechanism is triggered and stillness is gone. It's like letting go of control on life itself, a renunciation of life as I know it. I suspect that the sense of identification with the movements in the mind prevents full letting go. May you please advise. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's excellent. Absolutely true. But what happens is after a while, you kind of suspend fear. Because, and it's part of my job and any Sangha member's job to actually kind of brainwash you, condition you. To give it a try you are perfectly safe if you allow this this mind to actually dominate and actually transcend and just have this beautiful mind consciousnesses it's amazing just how safe you are and there's all these examples from the suttas this was a, a, a monk who i knew personally and uh, he was Indonesian. I go to Indonesia a lot. And over in Indonesia, there's this uh, like a Theravada monks community and Sangha. They get ordained over in Wat Bawan in Thailand. And but it's just a place which gives them legitimacy. And this particular monk, his name was Sudamo, and that uh, I met him in Wapawan, and the first time I saw him, I was walking with this monk, Venerable Ajahn Manindo. And as soon as I saw this monk, I turned around to Ajahn Manindo, that's a really powerful monk. And so I made a point of speaking with him. And this particular monk, uh, he wanted to be a hermit, a rishi. So he went into the middle of Java. This was many years ago, where there was lots of jungle in Java. And in the middle of Java, he sat down to meditate, found a nice place. And what he said was kind of interesting because obviously his English was a second or third language. And what he said was he was meditating, he saw this, this star come towards him. And what he said was he married that star. And that's the only way he could say that he united totally into it. And then when he came out of meditation, he noticed the forest had changed around him. The jungle didn't look the same as it looked when he started his meditation. And so he went to see the villagers and the villagers said, wow, you know, there was a big flash flood in that area. It was covered with you know, a couple of meters of water. How on earth did you survive? You were underwater for days. And I mention that because that's what happens when you get into deep meditation. Nothing can harm you. It's incredible. And I say that because no need to feel afraid. The only thing which makes you feel afraid is that fear because you haven't been there before. But after a while, you know that you get some confidence. You go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. And once you actually jump in, it's like taking the kid to the swimming pool. Once you know, they're afraid of water. They haven't experienced water before. All they've done is tread and learn how to walk on dry land. And they've fell down many times and hurt themselves. But now they've mastered walking on dry land. And now you put them in this 
wet stuff as water. How on earth can they survive in that? So first of all, you show them other people in the water. They're safe and having a great time. And then if they're still scared, you take them to the edge of the water and just put two feet in there, their two feet, and take them out quickly afterwards. So that's not bad, and they actually quite like it. But uh, you know, up to the knees in it, take them out, put the whole two legs in the water. That's nice. And then half their body in the water, and then lift them out. And then you drop them in the water totally, and then you can't get them out again. They're having too good a time. And that is like deep meditations. You go a little bit, try it out. It's okay. You try a little bit more, and it's okay. But once you get into it, you don't want to come out. There's just too much joy and pleasure and fun. So you've got nothing to worry about. But it is what you saw was totally true. You can't control these things. Once you're in, your sense of will has disappeared. But it's worth it. It's just like the person who's been in jail for 50 years and they're going to be released tomorrow. Of course they'll be afraid. What you're afraid of is afraid of freedom and bliss and great insights. And that's what we're afraid of because we're not quite used to this. But after a while you test it out, you test it out a few times and my job is to basically convince you they're fun, they're great things to do, it's how the Buddha practiced. And the thing which is, I've been saying this a lot recently, but the thing which kind of convinced me was when you actually read in Pali how the Buddha described even just the first jhana. And even in that first jhana, he said, one of the ways of describing what you're feeling in the first jhana, he said it's some bodhi sukha. Sukha is like bliss. And some bodhi is the Buddha's word for enlightenment. That's just in the first jhana. You experience enlightenment bliss. It's like a feeling, a taste of enlightenment. Not the theory of it, but the experience. This is what it feels like. My goodness, that just is such a powerful when you understand what some bodhi is, enlightenment. It's not enlightenment. You're not fully enlightened. But what you have is a taste of what it's like. And then once you taste it a few times, oh, that really gets you into more meditation and deep meditation. You don't ever want to feel afraid of going in those places anymore. You're afraid of not going to those places more likely. So whoever had that question, well done, you've made great progress. Next time that happens, and it will, you've tasted it once. Take away the fear. I'll, I'll give you a money back guarantee. When you go into those deep meditations, uh, really sort of powerfully, then you just, you can probably try and come and see one of our monks or nuns. If it's Fenor Chanda, you'll bow down to her and say, thank you for organizing this retreat. One of the best things you've ever done for me. Give it a go. I, I don't lie to you. I don't try and cheat you or exploit you. I just want you to please go and enjoy the amazing meditations. Okay, there's one more question in the box. So, uh, and uh, if there are no more after this, I might just ask you a follow up on the last one, Ajahn. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, if I get into deep meditation, I understood I lose track of time. If I don't have a timer, how do I manage to wake up? Is there any control of when it's going to happen? <laughs> I like to meditate in silent places in nature, but I have to be able to get back home before my family starts to worry. Yes, thank you for asking that question. It's very easy, the solution. What you do is, if you feel this is going to be a very nice meditation, you can understand that the body is ready, the mind is ready, the situation is really good. Then what you do is, as you sit down, before you even start, maybe get your, you know, 
a mindfulness going, but before you really get into the meditation, you make a resolution, Aditana. You say, I have to come out by 3 p.m. today. I have to come out at 3 p.m. today. I have to come out at 3 p.m. today. In your own words, make it accurate, and then forget about it. You'd be surprised as how accurate that really is. You come out one or two minutes either side of 3 p.m. My first meditation teacher when I did a retreat over in Cambridge University, and I was still a student, he was suggesting that when you go to bed tonight, set your alarm clock to say five past, whenever you want to get up, say five past five in the morning or five past four in the morning. Set your alarm clock at five past the time you want to get up, but then tell yourself, I will get up at four. Now, five minutes before your alarm was going to ring. And say it in your own words three times as mindfully as you possibly can, then it gives it power. And then just forget about it and go to sleep. And I tried that for the first, for the week I was on this retreat, the nine days, and I couldn't believe how well it worked. You know, I'd set my alarm for, say, five past five, but I determined to get up at 5 a.m. And then say those words, I would get up at five, I would get up at five, I would get up at five much more slowly than that and really aware of what I was saying. And you wake up in the morning, your eyes would open and you look at the, the alarm clock, what, what kind of time is it? And then you look at the alarm clock and it was one or two minutes before or after five. So you turn the alarm off. The alarm never rang, didn't need to. You only got your own mind clock. So I'm not going to call it body clock, but mind clock. And you find that it's, once you learn how to use it, it's very, very accurate. So you tell yourself, I can't meditate for too long. I've got to come out of this time. And you will. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So there is another question here. Um, I'm not sure if I understand it fully, but I think this person's getting still. Anyway, in meditation, it's an energetic movement inside, and sometimes it's very moved and it's not possible to think. I don't know if that means moved or still. Do we mean moved as uh, nothing is moving or it's inspiring? Or is it? Yeah, you... it sounds to me. I'll read it again, but I think it sounds as though the mind is not thinking, it's not possible to think anymore. In meditation, it's an energetic, energetic movement inside, and sometimes it's very moved and it's not possible to think. What do you advise? Thanks, I am very inspired. Great, if that's what's happening, don't think. You know, just this thinking has got a, a reputation it doesn't deserve. Instead of thinking, learn how to know. Instead of actually seeing and thinking about what this means, just explore it. Have a little bit of courage to see what you're going to find. Now, innovation. Look, just to let you know of some of these stories to try and convince you that when you're not thinking, you can get far more insight and see so much more deeply that one of the heroes of which I have when I was young there's this fellow who developed you know, physics, quantum tunneling. His name was you know, Brian Josephson. And I think it was Brian Josephson. He became the first Welsh person to get a Nobel Prize for physics eventually. But he got his idea and insight after coming out of meditation. He was doing TM meditation at that time, but still he got still enough all of those ideas which he had had, which he couldn't find solutions to, the solutions just came to him. And very quickly after the meditation, he got a Nobel Prize for that. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, it's not just, you know, for the peace, the bliss. You get so many insights and understandings when you stop thinking. Great thinkers have great headaches when you're still and peaceful. You see so much further. Super. Okay, so 
That's perfectly timed because all the questions are ended. But I just had one little comment about the previous question of the fear coming up when somebody's getting stuck. Oh, yeah. Their sense of self disappearing. What I've found really helpful for going deeper in meditation and overcoming fear is a lot of meta practice. What do you think about that, Ajahn? Because that can oh, provide yeah. like, that so called inner safety mechanism that's triggered, which is really kind of a nervous system thing, isn't it? Getting, you know, yeah. feeling, no. unsafe, feeling kind of unsteady. But the meta really softens that and gives such a sense of being held and being safe. Basically, that I yes. can override those other that, more kind of excellent dependencies. But also, the meta shows you how to accept the bliss and the peace. I know this mum, I come very close to him, but I can't say his name. He's still alive. And you know, I've got certain rules which I have to keep. I remember how he was experiencing getting right next to the jhanas and then just. It got scary and said, should I, should I? Oh, it's a bit much for me. Maybe should I, shouldn't I? And it was just so close. And the only thing which he could do was just look at it. And then well, it was so beautiful in there. And I was, I'm afraid I might lose so much, but it's so gorgeous in there. And then basically thinking, not thinking, but feeling, oh, what the hell, I'm going for it. And then of course the darkness happened. You don't need to feel afraid, and you'll be so. Uh, please excuse my bad English. You'll be so pissed off if you don't go for it. <laughs> you got this wonderful chance. <laughs> Just go for it. It's free. The best happiness you can possibly have is what you're supposed to be doing. The next time that happens, just enjoy. Just let yourself merge into that gorgeous experience. You come out afterwards, unfortunately, <laughs> actually fortunately, and you come out with all these incredible insights. You will not regret it. Ever. I've never seen anyone regret going to a deep meditation. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Ajahn. It's um, two o'clock over here, and I think nine o'clock for you, and you've been up since one in the yeah. morning. So <laughs> it's probably time you uh, have some rest, unless you're too inspired to sleep, I don't know. <laughs> so thank you very much.